joining us for Meet the Professionals. This is a video series where we interview a variety of professionals from different career paths to find out more about their backgrounds, how they got into their field, and to get advice if you're interested in becoming a member of that profession as well. Today, we have Nick Perotti, a research engineer and scientist working for NYU Langone's orthopedic surgery department. He has worked there for the past five years. Uh, he works with surgeons and professors in different fields to improve surgical and recovery techniques. So hello, Nick. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me. No problem. We're very excited. Uh, so just let's kick it off with tell us a little bit more about your job. What do you do in a day? Uh, well, that's that's a bit of a broad spectrum answer. Uh, my job covers a wide variety of tasks ranging from uh, mostly simulation studies right now using uh, specific software. Uh, I will be responsible for um, looking at either new surgical techniques or um, the effects of, let's say, leaving in certain uh, hardware from uh, from an injury, let's say like a fracture or something, and seeing how that may impact uh, a child's growth plate, let's say, if, it, if, if they get hurt. Um, or um, setting up safety factors that surgeons can then work off of to determine how much, uh, how big of a hole, let's say, can we bore into somebody's bone before we compromise um, a person's ability to walk safely. Uh, and the other side of my job uh, can be a bit more of a wet lab hands-on experience sometimes where uh, I am machining parts, I'm making jigs, I'm making rigs that can, um, you know, hold up test samples for whatever it is I'm working with. And uh, there is these rare occasion where I've even been in the OR itself to observe how surgeries are done so I can have a much better understanding of uh, the certain elements that a surgeon may want me to focus on for their specific project. Very interesting. So if you could sum it up in one sentence, what is your, you have 30 seconds in an elevator app to tell someone what you do. I come up with better ways of uh, breaking people and putting them back together. Love it. So how did you get started in this? How did you decide this is what you wanted to do? Um, so it's actually really funny. I fell into this path um, from a fairly young age, I became interested in, uh, robotics and prostheses after watching Star Wars when I was a child. <laughs> and I cool. love that Luke Skywalker had a robotic hand and I thought it was one of the coolest things ever. And I was like, oh my God, it's so realistic. Like, I want to make one of those. And thus I dove down the rabbit hole of like connects and Legos and building and everything. And eventually, um, I used to do uh, charity race. I used to do setup for charity races uh, when I was in high school. And there was somebody there who was a full leg amputee, no leg uh, from the hip down on the right side. And uh, feels weird to say it, but like at that time, back in those days, like there wasn't really much of a high tech option that someone like him would be able to get that could, you know, bring back his ability to, to walk properly. And I kind of wanted to, I've always wanted to like help people in my career path. Um, and I, that was kind of like what led me to decide, like, you know, I want to be able to help someone like him to be able to, you know, ha bring, bring back that sense of like being able to walk again without the need of, of crutches again. Um, and from there, uh, I pursued a, a, an undergraduate degree in, in bioengineering from SUNY Binghamton. Uh, you can't get it now because now it's biomedical engineering. <laughs> we, we got ABED approved for, for full on bi uh, biomedical. So I missed that one, unfortunately, by a year. Um, and then I got my master's degree in biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon, uh, university in Pittsburgh. Um, I did a thesis uh, in a surgical mechatronics lab, and I spent a good deal of my time uh, concentrating on the fields of biomechanics, neuroscience, and robotics. I, I always liked the idea of 
building and working, my primary goal was always to work in um, a prosthetics lab. Um, but I realized uh, for where it was that I would have to go to in certain instances and also how much it pays because I learned very quickly, research is not a job you do necessarily for money. <laughs> Because you're kind of like banking on grants and everything for that paycheck. It's definitely one of those things of, um, yeah, I I, uh, I was very fortunate in that I was able to get a job six months after graduating. And I ended up as a private researcher for a hip and knee orthoplasty surgeon uh, at NYU Lango. Is that where you are now or is that a previous job i am still at nyu langone but um the surgeon i worked for has since retired uh we dissolved uh his uh, sorry his lab got dissolved um the covid kind of uh you know took us out of the lab and it really and it made it very difficult for uh for us to continue some research but ultimately uh yeah um my my boss uh, took that opportunity. I will say an opportunity in quotes uh, to be like, you know, I'm kind of, I'm ready to like bow out of this. Um, so he uh, he he retired, and um, I was fortunate enough at that time that uh, another doctor who was running the biomechanics testing core for NYU, um, his uh, lead research engineer uh, left. And so there was a vacancy and uh, he told me, he told the other doctor and he said, you know, uh, send him an email, tell him I sent you and hopefully uh, you'll have a job. And, and uh, that is where I have been now for the past two years. Um, I, I've graduated from focusing on hips and knees for three years to now working on everything everything the whole body a uh, whole body um hip knee wrist finger uh ankle shoulder um hopefully doing something with the spine at some point um a whole, whole i'm doing regenerative medicine with certain people uh i'm doing uh, m m uh, rat studies to see how uh, diets can affect arthritis development post injury. A uh, whole whole bunch of things. That is so fascinating. Um, let's just dial it back a second. So you got your undergrad, you got your master's degree. Were there any mm -hmm. other certifications, any other degrees that you needed before you started? Uh, I mean, uh, outside of just your standard like lab safety protocols for whatever it is you're going to go, which that varies by institute. Um, no, there were no other degrees. I mean, there's going to be training that you're going to have to uh, do depending on the type of work that it is you want to do. So like when I first started working for NYU, I had to become city certified. Uh, this would allow me to do uh, experiments um, that would have um, uh, uh, human and um, uh, eventually I did need to do one for, for animal uh, subjects as well because each of those have their own separate um, facilities that control that whole thing and uh, the animals are a lot more strict than 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 the people um, the, the animal for the Iacook you don't you don't mess with Iacook you don't mess with the IRB you really don't mess with Iacook <laughs> I love that. Gotta protect those animals. Gotta protect them. So we make sure that they have all the best, like the best, like little bedding and whatnot. They have their little, their little toilet paper rolls to chew on. Aww. So in your day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. I know there's no, there's never such a thing as a typical work day or a typical week, but what does a week look like? for you? What's the balance of research sure. to paperwork? So typically for me, um, it's a whole lot of research. There is paperwork that does fall into it once 
um, the experiment is done, which, you know, sometimes can take a few months to even a year in certain cases, because it's just a lot of fine tuning uh, those elements, figuring out, um, you know, is this anatomically good for all, despite all of our simplifications? Um, because a lot of what I do, especially in, uh, in, in a simulation environment, um, I use Fusion 360. Uh, that is the, the software that I, that I use. Um, so to give you an idea, my, my work week can consist of getting a stack of patient CT files. And then I then convert those CT files into a mesh model that can be read into my simulation environment. And then from that mesh model, I isolate each of the bones. In this instance of, let's say, um, I'm working on a hand and I'm working on a particular procedure called a scaphoidectomy, which is where the doctor will um, cut this bone in half, essentially. Um, so what I need to do is I need to isolate every single bone in the metacarpal region of your hand um, from a giant mesh blob. And I have to make it look all nice and pretty. And I have to, um, I did this already, thankfully, but I have uh, custom materials that I've made that capture the biomechanical properties of cortical bone. In this instance, I've had other projects where I've also had to include cancellous bone, which is the uh, the soft spongy bone that's uh, that cushions uh, like your long bones and everything like your femur, let's say. Um, so I have uh, custom material libraries that I've had to made by scrounging through papers myself, trying to find all of these values because, you know, we can't just have all our answers in one nice neat document. Um, so... Um, it will be uh, running simulations on establishing a baseline average. So I have all my hand bones I I isolated. I apply the necessary force where I need to apply it. And then I run a simulation. And then I will apply the scaphoidectomy. And I will do uh, two variations of that. One where we remove the top half of the scaphoid. And one where we remove the bottom half of the scaphoid. And then... I will do that for each of the CT scan patient samples that I have been given. And we determine, you know, um, is it a type one risk? Is it a type two risk based off of like, how do the bones sit? Because this is based off of a previous paper that uh, the doctor I'm working for on, uh, on this project, uh, she's trying to put forward this notion that um, there are different risk types in certain people. You can tell based off of how certain bones in the hand sit, they may be more prone to arthritis. Um, so taking all of that, sending it off to the statisticians to then do their, their, uh, statistical work. And then once they have the results and we see everything, um, however long that then takes, um, we can then start working on a paper and I will, um, I will assist in the methods and the results section, um, uh, because for the most part, uh, I do not have the medical training in that sense for the full introductory breakdown, or uh, I may not be savvy enough to know all of the implications that this may uh, have on the human body. But that's kind of like one of the perks of my job that I enjoy the most is I always get to learn all these new things. Because it's like, I want to know what this, what, what does this mean? And just going to the doctor and be like, so what does, what did I just do here? Like I did this thing for you. Now, what what is all this for, and and what happens with it? I love that. That's also one of my favorite parts of my job. I love learning about new things, especially by talking to people. So, so that can easily be it. Throw in, you know, a sprinkling of meetings here and there. I have a, a weekly lab meeting every every Monday. Um, I have a bi-weekly, uh, not bi-weekly, sorry, every two weeks, um, we have a work in progress meeting where all the labs get together and someone will make a presentation. And then uh, if they're stuck on anything or they don't know how to progress or they just want to show like what it is that they're working on, they present it to the other labs. We can ask questions. We can make sure that they are following a, uh, a proper guide or maybe they're missing something. Uh, it's essentially having 
a whole bunch of extra eyes looking at your project. And yes, sometimes it's terrifying because you're performing in front of now like five different doctors, a surgeon, and all their respected uh all, all of their respective uh students and and uh postdocs and doctoral candidates and everything. About how many people is that in that meeting? Uh it fluctuates, but it can easily be 20 people sometimes, 20 people in that room that you that it's just one person presenting to and you're just there just like, yep, this is this is my work. This is what I'm doing. This is what I hope to achieve. Um, but maybe like I'm stuck on uh, a certain uh, chemical pathway or, and we're trying to like induce this specific behavior in a cell, let's say, but we're not getting it. Uh, someone may be able to speak up like, you know, oh, have you tried uh, this factor? Have you, have you, have you tried applying uh, this, uh, th this specific biological marker to it? Things, things of that nature, which are very much outside of the scope of my specialty. Uh, I do not do cells. I do not do tissue so, uh, tissue mechanics. Um, so a lot of this does go over my head, but uh, it, again, is still a very good place to, you know, learn more about what's going on in all the other, some of the other labs around me. Um it's good because it, it shows that you still get to work on your project, but you still get to collaborate with other yeah. people and give feedback and get feedback, which is useful for everyone. It's it's never bad to have, uh, you know, that that extra set of, of eyes on the project. And that's one of the things I do wish I had more of in certain cases, because I am the only research engineer right now with the biomechanics training core. So, um, yeah, it's it's. It's one of those instances where it would be nice to have more of a, a team effort in that sense. Um, because as it is right now, I am juggling four different projects. That was my next question. How many different projects are you juggling and how do you manage that? It varies. I usually try to assign him based off of difficulty and how difficulty or tediousness, let's say, like how long it may take to do it because a job may be very hard to like comprehend or like do or put together but it can be done like sometimes a short amount of time other times it can just be like tedious but more so in the sense like it's just a very repetitive thing like the ct scans um uh that's just a lot of you know once you start getting the hang of you know I now know how to like shape my mesh. I know how to clean up the bones better. I've actually gone back in certain cases, cleaned up my other models, made them look nice and pretty now. So now everything is is nice and uniform. And then there are other instances where you're like, well, now I'm having to dabble in a whole section of my modeling software that I've never used before. So what was once a project of like, you know, yeah, this could take me like a month or so to get through. You have to go to the person who assigned you the project who, who has to work with you on this and you have to politely tell them you know i'm gonna need more time on this because i don't know how to do this off the top of my head and i need to learn how to do this real quick so please give me like lend me your patience please i'm gonna go consult some youtube videos and i'm gonna learn how to use this specific modeling environment sometimes youtube solves all of life's problems no. It really, really does. So I have two follow-ups with that. Um, one, so it sounds like you don't have to finish one research project to completion all in one, all at once. Like you can work on one, no. then take a break and go to the other one. So you can bounce back. Yes. And I do that to, pre to prevent burnout in certain cases. Because there is some, I mean, I'm actually relieved in a sense because this this upcoming Thursday I have uh, another project that I'm starting right now, so that's going to make five. But um, it's going to be an in-person uh, um, solely mechanics experiment, which it's not a hard it's not a hard process. It's we're literally taking a gel that this pro uh, specific professor made. I'm going to put it in machine, and I'm just going to watch it just pull it apart. That is it. Okay. And what is the goal? What are you trying to learn when it pulls it apart? 
So when we pull this gel apart, we are trying, we, we are looking at a load versus displacement graph. So from that, so I'm applying, I'm going to essentially watch uh, this machine apply a greater and greater load onto these gels that have uh, varying behavioral uh, properties. And as they are pulled, um, we're gonna, essentially gonna see a curve. And from that curve, I'll be able to determine uh, what is the stiffness of each gel. Uh, at what point does each gel start to yield, which is when we start seeing what's called plastic deformation. And plastic deformation is the, uh, think of it as the point of no return for a, for a material. Um, so the, the easiest way you can think of it is like uh, you take a ruler. If you were just like, you know, bend a ruler, it ideally just, you know, comes back to form. But if you bend a ruler too far, and if it's one of those like old school plastic rulers, you start seeing that thinning, that lightish green um, color sometimes, like where the bend is and it doesn't necessarily go back. That is where you're starting to have plastic deformation. That is your yield point. And that is important because you need, you need to keep your bones you in know place. How much can I apply before this thing starts to break because then there's the yield point and then there's the fracture point and that's just when the whole thing breaks all together and if you're putting that inside someone's arm or their leg that's kind of important yes because these these are meant to be cell scaffolds so these will be um a uh a, a, a vehicle essentially for cells to grow and uh since they're being used for tension uh with this with a specific test my guess is we're going to be seeing these used in uh, ligament or tendon replacement or muscle growth, um, things in your body that are, you know, their whole job is I get pulled constantly. I, I'm meant to expand and contract, and I have to be able to do this repeatedly day after day after day. Again, so no pressure there. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> But then my other question was related to what you said about YouTube. So um, how do I say this? Like, where do you learn your information besides YouTube? What other systems, what other software do you use? So predominantly the main softwares that I use, I use uh, MATLAB for some pseudocoding uh, for making my data plots and everything. Um, a lot of Microsoft. A lot, a lot of Excel spreadsheets, a lot of PowerPoints, and a lot of a lot of documents, a lot of Google Docs. So it's just you know, here's the here's the Google Doc, so we can all work on it. So we're not emailing version one, version two, version final, version final point two, version final no for real. Like, just everybody work in the one Google Doc, please. Just make our lives easier. We um, love Google Docs exactly for that reason, because you can only rename a file so many times. It's a blessing. Um, but, um, I mentioned that I work in Fusion 360 and then I have a bunch, I, I have a few, uh, just, you know, random programs that I've only learned about fairly recently. Uh, one of them is called Slicer. Slicer is what I use to convert my CT scans into, uh, the, um, uh, the mesh models for my, for, for Fusion. So that is a program that I didn't have to know about until not too long ago when apparently nobody knew how to be able to uh, get into, uh, how, how to convert these files. I always thought radiology did it. And then everybody was like, no, radiology doesn't know how to do this. I'm like, well, then somebody lied to me or someone's not doing their job and they're just hiding. So I learned how to do it just to save time. So when things like that come up and you don't know how to do something, are you just teaching it, learning it yourself, like looking online, teaching there's it to a yourself? Lot of, there's a lot of learning on the fly. There's a lot of learning on the job. Uh, there's a lot of, um, and I will always say this, there's a lot of, um, you know, realizing and understanding you don't know as much as you thought you knew about your own body. <laughs> There is so much we do not know. And 
hearing a doctor talk about your body sometimes is like, oh yeah, no, like you have this specific bone and then it connects it. Like I just always know like the foot bones connected to the like chin bones. Like, no, they they, they throw all the medical jargon in like layman's terms, please. I have basic understanding of anatomy and physiology, but like you're 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 specifically saying like you know the the the, the talus and you know the all, all the all the other fun bones that 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 connect to it. Which one am I focusing on? The heel bone. Okay, the heel bone. Got it. I totally get that. Um, sometimes you just you don't know what you need to know. Yeah. Or even sometimes just uh, simple misunderstanding sometimes in terminology. What can mean um, one thing to an engineer sometimes can mean something entirely different to a doctor. And I had this, I had this come up, and this was actually an issue. Thankfully, that we caught fairly early on, and only delayed me by a week. Um, but one of the projects I was doing was um, one of those safety protocols for you know. Um, how much uh, soft tissue, how much soft bone can we safely extract from a person's heel, from that heel bone, um, before we compromise the bone too much and a person can't safely walk on it? And uh, we had a misunderstanding about the word vector. Uh Uh-oh. Uh, I know vectors um, to be force vectors. That is my first thought and inclination of, um, of when someone says, like, you know, we want you to change the vectors. Um, when the surgeon was thinking of vectors, their thought was the entryway that the tools are taking into the bone. So I adjusted one thing instead of the other thing. So this is one of the things where I should have I should have asked the question or they may have, it would have been helpful if they had to clarify, you know, specifically what they were looking for. Uh, Cause usually I send pictures and everything to know, to, to, to make sure that everybody's on the same page with, with all of this. So, you know, that whole measure twice, cut once property that is a dirty lie and never actually works. <laughs> it's gotta work somewhere sometime. At some point, at some point. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so I, I've used those, I've used those softwares. Um I have used 3D printing software. That was a very big part of my job for uh for a while with certain things. If I do certain uh physical models, um I definitely have gotten to use a, a variety of 3D printers. I've done ABS printing, I've done resin printing. Um and all of these have been used in certain experiments, whether it be um, making finger models to try to test out um, the stability of certain joint replacement techniques, or um, the biggest model I have, one of the biggest models I have made, uh, which was a fully 3D printed femur and tibia so that we could have a a modular um prosthesis model we could swap out different um uh different prosthetics onto the onto this specific knee model and we could see how each prosthesis would affect soft tissues around the knee specifically your medial and lateral uh collateral ligaments um and then how does the surgeon need to balance each 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 model essentially depending on you know is this person bow legged is this person knock kneed is this person you know uh, maybe they just inherently have loose loose ligaments how how do we how would a surgeon approach this problem that is fascinating and I love like I'm visualizing that if you like taking out a bone and putting it across the thesis and pretty much. That- is so cool to me because 20 years ago you wouldn't have been able to do that no i still remember when like when seeing 3d printing on like how it's made one time and i was like oh my god we can just make whatever we want now right okay and that leads me to one of my other favorite questions that i love to ask people is how has technology changed your job it's made it so much more complicated (laughs) 
not better? It's made it better, but it still makes it complicated because now it's more stuff I have to learn how to use. Take away the the you have to learn it aspect. Like how oh, it's inherently it? cool. It's absolutely incredible in that sense. Like the the thought that at some point, hopefully within the next couple of years, I'm still working at NYU. Um we are plan they're I mean they're planning on remo on revamping some of the lab, uh some of the lab space that they have over at the hospital. And um they are hope uh th there have been talks, whispers, rumors about getting a six degree of freedom robotic arm. That would be really cool to learn how to use. Like, what would you do with that robotic arm? Um, that would allow for much more varied uh, sample testing, because um, typically we have, uh, if I want to do, let's say, a compression test, or I want to do a tension test, I'm very limited in that I can only work in one dimension. I can only work straight up and down, typically. Um, with this robot, I could work... You know, what if it's at an angle? What if I want to apply, what if I have something straight up, let's say, but I want to apply a force here? I can't do that with most of the machines that we have in the lab currently. They 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 don't work for that. So okay. it's very cool to think of it that way, because otherwise then if I wanted to get it in like that specific point, I now have to build a jig that fits around the device and holds the 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 sample in the proper a lot in the proper way that i want this thing to hit it and then i have to hope it stays consistent every time a lot of room for error there's a lot of room for error yeah but so you have the robotic arm you've got 3d printing has changed the way you do your job um there's been else? that there has been i mean even the use of uh, the use of certain sensors um one of the sensors that we used was um it's it's a specific sensor that uh my my former boss used a lot in his surgical procedures and it measures the force between your femur and your tibia so that we can know how well balanced is your knee essentially because most people if if i was to tell you, you know like if you're standing straight up let's say do you think like between the left like if you're if you're looking at your leg and you have your your the right side of your knee and the left side of your knee not your legs but like the one leg itself do you think it's an even split of forces between the right and the left no okay you're correct in that I'm just but, thinking about like the way I naturally stand. It's like I don't distribute my weight evenly on two feet. So how could I distribute it evenly exactly. on one knee? So typically you have uh, more force on your medial side than you do your lateral side. So your yeah. inner leg versus your outer leg. Um so we use this sensor essentially as a means of showing, you know, like this is what the baseline should be this is our validation and this is what every you know surgery should now like ideally look to achieve in this sense by achieve you mean correcting someone's knee to get to that baseline during doing a a total knee arthroplasty let's say um if if they were to do a full knee replacement um and they have to re readjust things and whatnot they want to make sure that that prosthesis is sitting well um, to make sure that, you know, like those cuts were made properly and everything. Um, you could use this sensor to make sure, you know, hey, I'm, I'm looking at good forces right here. They're, they're in the range they're supposed to be. Everything looks good. Like it's not too tight on one side. It's not too loose on the other side. It looks good. And that makes surgery, that makes it easier yeah. during surgery because it's less guesswork. It makes it a lot, well, because most surgeons now, um, a lot of it, you know, is going to be, um, you know, how does it feel? Just put your finger there and you're like, yeah, it feels good. Does that seem the most accurate? Well, that's why we have numbers now. That's why technology is good. It's getting to see technology like that. It's getting to see technologies like, um, Oh, I mentioned it before. Um, 
a, what is considered a, a robot in a sense in, in the OR and whatnot. Because most times when you think of, you know, a robot, people want to think, you know, of like an Android, a cyborg, uh, some, something that's actually like moving around autonomously and, and on its own. And that is typically what we would consider a full-fledged robot in that sense. Um, consider robots to be uh, these autonomous moving um, machines, essentially. Um, so if you have someone, let's say, controlling it, is it really a robot then, or is it just a tool that the person is is using? So that's why some people say, like, the Da Vinci robot isn't really a robot. It's just, you know, it's just another means by which a surgeon who is, like, you know, the Wizard of Oz, you know, like, paying no attention to the man behind the, the curtain and whatnot um, as I use my joysticks to control this thing. I was going to say, to me, it seems more of like an extension of the person because it's not thinking or operating on its own. But So that is, that's one of the arguments that's usually made sometimes for like, you know, is this a robot or is it not a robot? So most times um, what you would see using the OR is a semi-autonomous uh, tool. So it has, in a sense, like some thinking capability that is meant to be viewed as um, safety parameters that prevent the surgeon from, um, let's say, because there are element of the, let me finish that statement, that prevent the surgeon from accidentally uh, going too far or going too deep or, um, you know, going outside, coloring outside the lines, let's say. That's the best way I can think of it. Um, because there are certain times that you know it's outside of the surgeon's uh, it's outside of the surgeon's hands in certain cases. Uh, if you're using a, a saw, sometimes the blade can curve in certain ways. If it hits like a nodule wrong, and the blade can maybe like start to curve up or curve down because it's a very thin blade that's going back and forth. Um, a a semi autonomous robot would know like the blade is starting to curve. I'm going to start retracting the blade now so that we do not go past the boundary of the that protective uh, um, focus area that the robot is thinking of. So, but then we do flip to the other side where there is actually a robot that can do a surgery entirely on its own without a surgeon guiding it. I don't know if I would be comfortable with that, but I guess at that point, whoever is being operated on is knocked out and wouldn't know the difference. Uh, I mean, granted, you do have to sign the waiver for it. I mean, okay. you, 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 you do consent to having, a, it's not just like, all right, we're going to knock you out. We're going to bring in the robot now. It's like, do you you agree to having a robot work on you, essentially? Okay. Okay. But well. I mean, the surgeon, the surgeon's there to prep you. He props your leg up. He secures your leg in place. They bring in the robot. They They secure everything that they need to. And then it's just go. We're going to move on to the advice section of this. Okay, so there seems to be a lot of, like, creative thinking. You have to think outside the box. You have to sort of figure out how you're going to do your research, prop up, make your jigs if you have to get to that angle, like you were saying before. Um, what other sort of skills do you think teens would need if they want to pursue this field? It's a lot of math. It's a lot of science. Um, but it is still a lot of creativity. It's a lot of imagination. It's a lot of um, being able to visualize an idea, see it through to completion, and it's a lot of communication. That's probably one of the biggest things I will always say, because I am not just the only person working on this. I am. It is always me and at least one other person, that one other person being the doctor. And if I do not relay my information correctly, or they do not re relay their information correctly, nothing gets done. Um, so as it's being able to, what's that? Sorry, as you mentioned with your vector story before, with yeah. the miscommunication on the words, yeah. But it's one of those things of, you know, not, it's being able to communicate effectively and also not allocating blame in that sense, it's never a finger, it's never a blame game. It's never whatever. It's just, you know, we had a miscommunication. We just correct it. 
It's it's not an like, oh well, like you did this, you didn't do this. It's you know, uh if, even if there's even if it's just a misunderstanding, you know, my apologies. I misunderstood what it was that you said, or per your last email, uh, I thought I was doing this, or this was our focus. Um, but thank you for the clarification. Now I know how to properly carry on. So it's it is it is humbling in many a way because if there's one thing that this job has taught me, uh, it is that I do not know nearly as much as I thought, and I that is a lesson I have been learning as I get older progressively and i started learning this i want to say around my junior year of undergrad where i was oh, like oh my god we all, learn. we all have to learn that as we get older <laughs> you don't know anything you really don't um so what classes would you recommend teens take in high school math reading uh i mean math is always good uh if you can get into calculus uh, I would recommend that because uh, it definitely helps to have a good understanding of calculus, um, depending on what track you want to go down. Um, take biology, uh, take chemistry, take physics. Um, physics is especially important in a lot of the stuff I do because we are looking a lot of times at those interactive forces and how they work. If you want to go down some of the more cellular tissue-based stuff, you may want to go down more of the chemistry in that sense. Um, writing, don't, don't shirk the writing classes because the better you can write, the easier time you'll have editing all your documents. Yeah, because you mentioned you work on writing the, um, the research and the methods. I help, I help a lot with writing the research papers, learning how to cite your references and cite everything the moment you find it. <laughs> Because we've all had that moment where you jot it down and you're like, I'll find this source again. You can exit out of the tab and then you go look for it like, where's my source? Where was my source? I just had it. And you're going through like you're diving deep into your history tab. We have all been there. And this is a bit of a side question. But did you learn how to research and properly cite sources in your high school English class in college? Did you learn it on I your own? I do. So... The style of referencing I have done has varied depending on what level of academia I have been in. Um, so, I mean, I know that I don't even, I know there's, was it AP, APA, there's. Um, APA, MLA, Chicago. Okay. So all of those different, this is the, this is the nightmare, but different research papers have different referencing and formatting requirements. So it could change every week it for you. Could change on the fly. So you have to look at what the specific format for the paper that you are applying for is supposed to be. And then you have to adjust your referencing to accommodate that paper. So I learned some basic referencing when I was in uh in high school doing doing research papers then it only got even uh it, it only um expanded. Uh, even more so when I was in undergrad and even further when I was in grad school, because at that point we were doing mock uh, grant drafts. So we were doing, we were doing things like that. And it's, it's one of those things where you learn very quickly. There isn't one nice, neat way to do it. There's always going to be 8 million ways that somebody wants something done there's not one uniform way, and it's going to be a lot of patience to realize, you know, all right, how's this one done again? Well, I got to, I got to go find this now. I got to go looking for for this thing, and it's absolutely cr crazy in that sense. And then, you know, like I said, also depending on what kind of track you want to go down um, in in college and whatnot, do you want to focus more on mechanics? And by mechanics, that can literally mean um, you know, structural mechanics, hard, uh, like rigid body mechanics, like for metals and whatnot, which is a lot of what I do. Um, or there's even tissue mechanics, soft body mechanics, there's, uh, soft robotics. There's a whole plus, th there are so many divisions in, in the field of just like, you know, where, how do you want to pursue things? Um, but in, in high school for right now, I would definitely say like core classes, 
uh, your sciences. Um, sorry, earth science. I know you usually get, you know, rock bottom, but, uh, you know, <laughs> bio, physics, and, and chemistry are going to be your, your three main ones that you want to want to look at. Calculus, if you can get into it, and, um, and your English class. That, that's going to be it. Learn, learn to write, learn, learn to cite. And uh, the other thing I will say is you don't have to be wordy when you write. I know there's a lot of times where teachers are always like, you know, you have to have um, a paper and it's got to be like this many pages, this many words. It is the exact opposite here. It is literally like you have 500 words and that's all you get. Okay, another like fun for fact certain for certain that. abstracts for certain for certain intro things that they want you like they they limit you to such an extent so it's like no no please give me i need more um, so what sort of part-time jobs or internships or extracurricular activities could teens get involved in that would help prepare them for this career if you are into anything related to coding if your school maybe has like a, a, a coding class, if your school has a shop class, a robotics class, these are all things that I wish I had been able to take. My high school didn't have anything like this. I learned how to do shop and robotics when I was in college. Uh, well, that was when I first had my introduction with like, you know, this is a lathe. This is how you use a lathe. Here is a, um, here's a, here's a, here's a drill press. Here's how you're going to learn how to use a drill press. And these are things that I've had to use in my job to make specific rigs and 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 uh, designs for people. Because there are times where it's like, cool, I can 3D print that, but plastic is not going to be strong enough to support like what it is I need to do here. Um, so yeah, anything, anything in in that capacity. If you have hobbies like that, if you um, if if you're into coding. Pursue coding, because honest God, if you can do coding, there's so much that you can do in, in any sort of engineering in that sense. Um, but yeah, those those are, uh, I would say, any, any clubs like that, any clubs where it forces you to critically think in that sense and to work together in a team. Okay. Learning, learning how to... Even, I mean, for that sense, even any any sport in that sense, because you're learning how everybody is going to have their role to fill. Every Everybody is going to have their specific part to play. I love that. I love that example of sports, because that's not something that you would naturally think of when it comes to research. No, but it's still that whole method methodology of thinking, like, this is by far and away like it's always going to be a team aspect thing yeah it, it, it's never just you if it was if it, if, it, if it was just me i wouldn't be doing research because i would have all the money in the world to finance myself and i would not be doing this oh okay and now for my last question what advice would you give to a young teen who wants to follow in your footsteps or even a young Nick back in the day as he's getting into the field. What do you know now that you would give advice to a younger you? I would definitely say um, for the, for the, if it was, if it was to a younger me, and this is stuff that I've reflected on many a time. Um, and I, I would have done mechanical engineering instead of bioengineering to start. I would have gotten a better foundation um, in that field to be more diverse in a sense and then go into biomedical afterwards uh, but that is mainly because of just the type of program that i had that was available to me back in you know my time it's come a long way now it is it is by far and away so much more advanced now than from when i was in undergrad um but don't be afraid of trying new things. Don't be afraid of failure because failure is going to happen a lot. And it's always a learning experience. That's, that's going to be one of the biggest things that you're going to take away from. And that's how you're going to find out what works best sometimes is we tried it. It didn't work this way. 
what's what's our next option um and that's still something that you know i have to remind myself every so often because there are times where it's like you know i want to try this but i'm afraid of wasting material but that's what the material is there for you're you it is it is there to be used and to learn and to figure out how is this supposed to be done well, that was fantastic. And I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you um, for having me. If anyone watching has any questions for Nick, please feel free to email us at teams at levittownpl.org. And please visit our YouTube channel to see more videos in the Meet the Professional series. Thank you again, Nick. Thank you, Amy.